Good afternoon ladies and gents, my name is Mrs. Sylvia and today we're going to look at the Grade 11 Life Sciences Formal Test Preparation. Now, um, Grade 11s, I know that you may have missed quite a few uh, or a few weeks of contact time last year and we will not have been able to give you all the information that we wanted but the uh, Grade 11 Life Sciences Preparation is all according to the annual teaching plans, the ATPs. So um, you can ask your teacher if you wish that he or she provides you with the annual teaching plans. Um, it will be available. It just makes it easier for you to study because it tells you exactly what you need to know. Okay, so let's have a look. I have it here. <clears throat> we are starting with the term two formal test preparation. All right, now uh, how will it work now term two? How is it going to work? So you would have had an assignment now already that is out of 50 marks. You would, um, I think, have finished it by now. And then we are going to write this formal test that counts 50 marks. The red 20% that you see, all of them are counting towards your final mark. So you can ignore them for this term. For this term, the following is important. Your assignment is going to count 25% and the test is going to count 75%. That will be your 100% for term 2. So as you can see, the test is quite important. How will your test look? As I said previously, you did not have a lot of exposure last year, so maybe you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But um, grade 10, 11 and 12 from this year onwards, it will have two sections, a section A and a section B. And as you can see here, I have the test mark allocation and the exams in the, in the last term, uh, the allocation for the marks as well. So a section A will be a, a combination of different types of questions like MCQ that you see here that is multiple choice questions you should uh, be familiar with them by now the terminology that you complain about the column statements and items that means fit column A to column B and then the data response or the data response sometimes there's another question added especially when it gets to the exams maybe it will be a, a, a diagram and they ask you questions about it or to label it, it all depends. Then section B, that will be our longer types of questions, okay? As you can see here, what happens is there's two questions, a question three and a question um, a question two and a question three, they will be 50 marks each when it's your exam, but in this instance it will be 15-15. So it will be 20 marks short questions and 15-15 for the longer questions and that will give you 50. There's no essay question anymore. Okay, now just something I want to show you, it is actually your teacher's problem or the person that's setting the paper and not your own. Um, when we set papers, we use this cognitive level weighting and the degrees of difficulty. This is what I want you to see, that it is easy for the average learner, 30% of the work. So you must be able, you will be able to pass this. And the more you put in, the better it becomes. A life sciences is like a language. You have to practice it. You have to speak it. You have to write it. You have to think it. And that is how you get to know it, especially when it comes to the terminology and the um, definitions. All right. Now, your mark allocation and minutes, it's 50 marks and 50 minutes. If your teacher is setting uh, the test himself or herself and they feel that one of the case studies or the sections that you need to read may be a little bit longer, then maybe they can increase it to 60 minutes. It all depends on your situation. So <clears throat> the set marks, it's 50 marks. All right. And this is um, what you will be doing for this year. We finished term one. Term two, you would have finished this uh, assignment already. And then when you write your test, it will be about the work that we have completed from week one until week eight. That is what we used to set your paper with. Um, the 
information comes out of the ATPs. Now the ATPs that the teacher receives, it looks like that, what you must do for every week. And as you can see, you are writing up to week eight, the last section about respiration, you are not writing your formal test about. Um, that is not allocated this time. So when I now uh, look at the work as well, I'm going to use this as my guideline. This is the least you must know. And you can't summarize the work because when you summarize it, if you don't study everything, we are going to summarize your marks. All right, so let's start. <clears throat> We are starting with the process photosynthesis. Now, if you can remember grade 10, that is what we looked at the different types of um, cells that we have in the leaf and in the stem and in the root. So you should know that by now. And you will also know that the functions would be photosynthesis, gas exchange and transpiration for a plant. But just to get you started now at first, the process of photosynthesis, it happens with plants. Here we have a huge tree and then we look at a leaf. Now, um, just to revise quickly, this leaf is made up out of certain parts. Okay, this big section of the leaf we call the blade or the lamella, meaning that section that is exposed or that we would like to expose to the sun so that photosynthesis can take place. You see here the sunlight comes in. That top part of the leaf is called the apex. This bottom part is called the base. And then you will see there's veins. And then we have this main one here in the middle. And then this whole leaf is made up out of different types of cell. cells. They are differentiated, meaning they are built in a specific way to do their job. Okay, so the process photosynthesis is supported by the way the plant is built in order to get the sunlight and the carbon dioxide, the enzymes and the chlorophyll and the energy from the inside as well as the water from the roots to give sugars to the plant, in other words to give, give food to the plant and then to give oxygen to us. So the big thing happening here, using certain things to give us oxygen and the plant food. That is the whole function of photosynthesis, okay? Now, what do we need? Look at this lovely uh, flower. Here it shows us we get water from the soil, water and nutrients. It's taken up by the root and then it goes up through the xylem tissue. If you still can remember, the xylem is transporting the water and the minerals. It takes it to all the parts of the plant and inside the phloem is now making the food and then with the sunlight, with the water, with the carbon dioxide, the process of photosynthesis is taking place. We are using all of these things and it is giving us sugar for the plant itself and oxygen. And remember, we most many times eat the plants ourselves, so then we get food also. Because when you remember the different trophic levels, um, then people, they do eat plants. Okay, now very important. I made a lot of summaries here for you. Hopefully it will help. It will stick in your brain somewhere. So just have a look. First of all, the leaf. Here we have the leaf. And when we look inside of the leaf, there's different types of tissue. Okay, so just again. That section of the leaf is called the base. This section of the leaf is called the apex. Now, when I see apex, when I see that A, it makes me think of the Christmas tree because A is for the top part of the tree. That's the apex, the top. So the top part of the leaf will be the apex as well. And then that big vein there in the middle is where we're going to see the xylem and the phloem. All right, so the structure of the leaf, the leaf is made in such a way so that it can do its function. All right, here we have all the information that shows us photosynthesis. We have light energy. The water comes from the roots. The CO2 comes in through this tomato. And then inside the chloroplasts, we are going to get the process. And then it makes sugars for the plant itself. And then the O2 
the oxygen is coming out of this tomato again. But now, what you need to remember, very important, how the leaf is built to get the light in. Okay, the leaf needs to get the sunlight in. So how is it going to get the sunlight in? The first thing that you need to remember there on the outside, the top part there is the waxy cuticle. The waxy cuticle will be transparent and then it will let the sunlight come through. Then just underneath that waxy cuticle, we see those cells, that layer it forms there. That is called the epidermal cells or epidermis. And they are also transparent because they need the light to come through. The light must get to the chloroplasts. All right. Then just underneath that, we have these long cells. They look like palisades. And they indeed are called palisade cells. Now their stru structure looks like this because they want to channel the light deeper into the leaf so that it can get to all the chloroplast. So we have these cells that is tube-like that is channeling the light in. They are called palisade cells. And then we also have these other cells that's the spongy mesophyll where the gas exchange will take place. But the leaf is adapted in this way to give us light. That's the first thing you need to remember. And then the next thing for the CO2 and the O2, um, the gas exchange. What do we need to know about these cells? These palisade cells, they have very thin walls so that the movement of gases can happen in between, um, in and out. Remember that dot that you see there? That's the chloroplast. And photosynthesis is going to take place inside the chloroplast. So first of all, the palisade cells and then the spongy cells that you can't see now, they have thin cell walls so that the gases can move in and out with, uh, through the fusion so that we can have gas exchange. And then in between the spongy cells, we have large spaces so that there can be movement of gases. And then obviously the stomata, there I see one, there I see one, there's one. It's an opening where water vapor can go out for transpiration. And then obviously where CO2 comes in and O2 can go out. That is for the gas exchange. And then the last thing about the leaf I want you to remember, and that is uh, to have less water loss. We don't want the leaf to lose, lose water because then it's going to be wilting like you in period seven. Every day you look as if you are wilting. The waxy layer on top of the leaf is a certain thickness because it prevents water from evaporating. And then if we have fewer stomata, the less stomata, the less water that's going to evaporate. And then when the stomata are closed, there will be less water lost. Okay? I also included here the chemical reaction that is taking place. And that is very important that you remember this. You don't have to remember the balanced um, reaction. You just need to remember water plus carbon dioxide then we use light chlorophyll and enzymes that's now inside and it produces glucose and oxygen. And that's the main function. The main function is to produce food and to produce oxygen. But we will get back to that. Okay, so just remember how the leaf looks and how the leaf is built for its function. Okay, here we have a close-up and personal picture. Again, there on the outside at the top we have the waxy layer. Then here we have the epidermal cells. The waxy layer and the epidermal cells are translucent, so the light can come through. Those cells that looks like little worms, yeah, they are the palisade cells, palisade mesophyll. They are parenchyma, meaning that they can photosynthesize. They have chlorophyll, and that is what you can see there. That's the chloroplast the organelle where photosynthesis will take place. These are the cells that you see here. That's the spongy mesophyll, and there's lots of spaces in between them. They have a thin cell wall, like the palisade cells, for gas exchange. Here we have the stoma. One opening is called a stoma. Many of them are stomata. Here we have the guard cells that will open and close according to... Um, if it's now swollen or not, okay? 
there is the vascular bundles now the vascular bundles vascular meaning they are moving something they are transporting something for us so this will be <coughs> excuse me the xylem and the phloem now what is the function of the xylem the xylem will bring us all the water and the mineral salts from the roots excuse me and then the phloem will make the sugars uh, or will take the sugars to all the parts of the plant. Okay, so here you can see the cuticle again, guard cell, chloroplasts. This is part of the grade 10 work, but it's very important that you know the different cells, how they are built and why they are built like that, so that you can determine or tell us what is the function. Okay. Now another way to see this, we start with the leaf, because many times when we directly go inside, you guys are confused, your GPS is broken, you don't know where in the cell we are, and then we lose you. So first of all, we start with the leaf here on the outside. Now when I take that leaf, and I take the leaf and I look at it like this, I cut through it there, if this page is now a leaf, and I cut through it there, this is what I will see. That whole story that we've been doing the whole time. Epidermis, waxy cuticle, palisade cells, spongy um, mesophilos, uh, spongy parenchyma. And here we have the stomata and the guard cells and the epidermis again. And now I go inside that mesophil cell. I want to go to the chloroplast. So this next picture is that specific mesophil cell that I have there. And now I go to him. So I'm going in again. Here I can see there's the chloroplasts inside this one cell, a nucleus and the vacuole. And when I go, go closer and I look at the chloroplast, this is how a chloroplast will look. It has different sections like this. It has all other um, cell organelles that you have learned about, the ribosomes. The ribosomes are important when we are making proteins. You will learn about that a little bit later in grade 12 as well. So they are making proteins and in this case also enzymes, which is important for photosynthesizing. Ne? Then these structures, they look like disks. And they look like disks to increase the surface area because the more of them we have, the more photosynthesis can take place. So they are thin, flat disks to take up a little bit of space but to have a lot of surface area so that photosynthesis can take place. We call them, uh, one of them is called a granum. Okay, so that's a granum, 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 and granum. And then this, I want to say, juice inside we call the stroma, and the stroma is important because one of the two phases is taking place in the stroma, and the other phase is taking place inside the granum. Okay, so now when I take one of the granums and I increase it again, it will look like that. And then they go even further, thylakoid, they take the thylakoids, one of them, that's the thylakoid, and then it looks like that, but we're not going that far it's just to help you to understand where we are. We're going to look at the chloroplast now, okay? The structure of the chloroplast, very important. Okay, later on when you finish a cellular respiration, the teachers like to ask you uh, to identify the chloroplast, to identify the mitochondrion, and then they ask you about the processes. So let's have a look here first. Okay, this is now a chloroplast. On the outside, we have membranes, two membranes, okay? The membranes helps uh, to keep out what must be out and to bring in what needs to come in. So it is uh, only going to allow those certain particles that's important. The others, they are going to keep out, okay? Then this yellow-green-like area is the stroma, like they say, aqueous fluid. And here we have the enzymes and we will have the ribosomes here. Now this is where the dark phase is going to happen. Okay, it sounds ominous, but it's the dark phase here. Ne? That is one of the phases of photosynthesis. Then here we have the discs again to increase the surface area. We call that the granum. That is a stack of thylakoids. Okay. We call these discs um, 
thylakoids. Okay, and there we have the lamella. The lamella also contains chlorophyll. All right, and we have chlorophyll in abundance because we need it for photosynthesis to take place. Yeah, in these granums, it can be in all of them. We have the light phase taking place. That's one section of photosynthesis. And outside here in the stroma, we have the dark phase taking place. Make sure you know what is happening where. Okay, here's our summary. Um, you don't have to know the detail of the dark phase and the light phase. You just need to know the main things that's happening. So before we start with that, let's just look at the equation. Um, very, very easy to remember. We have water. Water is H2O. You should know that by now. Carbon dioxide, CO2. A plant uses water from the root, CO2 from outside, and then it goes into the leaf. And then the light that comes in, the chlorophyll that's already in the chloroplast, and the enzymes that's already in the stroma, all of them and energy contributes in this process to make sugar, C6H12O6, that's glucose, and then oxygen. So that's the byproduct. The main thing why they photosynthesizing plants is they want sugar. They don't need oxygen. They give it off. That is called the byproduct. And the main product here is sugar. And then the requirements are water and CO2. So when they ask you what is the requirements for photosynthesis, water, CO2, and then also we need light, sunlight, we need the chlorophyll that's in the chloroplasts and the enzymes that's helping. The enzymes are taking energy-rich atoms. They are moving them for us, so they are very important to make the sugar and then the oxygen that we need. So that is your equation. You can do it in the chemical formula way or you can do it in words. All right? Now, photosynthesis. There's two phases, ladies and gents. Very important. We have the light phase and the dark phase. I mean, that's easy to remember, light and dark. Okay, so where is the light phase happening? Like we said, the light phase is happening in the granum. The dark phase is happening in the stroma. So get your mind set so that you remember your chloroplast. That is why this is the same shape. So now in the granum, where the light phase is happening. We have the chlorophyll there. The water comes in through the plant, H2O. It um, combines with the chlorophyll, okay? The sunlight's energy comes in. So they are all combining. It's forming ATP, which is the energy carrier. It is the taxi for the energy. Adenosine triphosphate, but you also don't need to know that. ATP. And then what happens with these H's? They are broken up to form energy-rich hydrogen atoms. And then they go to the dark phase in the stroma so that they can use the um, CO2 that comes also in from the plant. The C, the O's, and the H's will form together CHO, C6H12O6. It will form the sugar, the glucose. So all of these things work together. We're taking water, we're taking carbon dioxide, it comes into the dark phase in the stroma where the enzymes are as well, and then they make the sugar, okay? And here out of this reaction we get oxygen, so that is the oxygen that humans use. So all of the things that we talked about here in your equation, it's also what is happening in the light and the dark phase, all right? Very important, I'm saying again, what do you require, what are used, and what are the products? Where is this happening? Inside the grana, the light phase, inside the stroma, the dark phase. Okay, now, it's not always as easy as that. Okay, we will have graphs, and you will, be, you will have to interpret the graphs. So when we look at photosynthesis, there are certain factors that's influencing the rate, how fast photosynthesis is taking place. Obviously, when you have lots of energy, lots of sunlight, lots of um, 
enzymes, chlorophyll, water, CO2, then the more you have, the quicker this will happen. But at some stage, you're going to run out of all of the requirements and then we won't have photosynthesis or it will be very slow. So what are the things that's influencing photosynthesis? Okay, you've guessed it. Light is the first one. So here's the graph for light intensity. And you can see, just have a look again, our x-axis, that's the light, the amount of light, the light increase, and the rate of photosynthesis. So as the light increase, so does the, the rate of photosynthesis. But then you're at a stage, it's not increasing anymore, it's now becoming constant, or it's going to be stabilized. Now the reason why this can happen is because um, they can run out of CO2 or water or we short something that is needed in the equation. You remember our equation? If we don't have enough water and we don't have enough CO2, doesn't matter how much light we have, then it will start to just become stabilized. So you can get questions about this. You can get an investigative question where um, they ask you about lower intensity, higher intensity of light. So when we have more light, the more light we have, the greater the rate of photosynthesis. So when you answer questions, ladies and gents, I hope you can see here, we have an A section and we have a B section. And that is referring to what we have on the X and the Y axis. So the moment you have um, to compare something or talk about a graph, you have to talk what is happening here, you have to talk about what is happening here. So when the light intensity increase, the rate of photosynthesis will increase until it is it reach a constant rate because of limiting factors. Something is now limiting this, okay? That's the first thing that can happen. Then the next factor that's influencing rate of photosynthesis can be the concentration of carbon dioxide. And here we have it, okay? The same story. Remember, too much CO2 is toxic anyway. So in the beginning, as the concentration of carbon dioxide increase, the rate of photosynthesis increase until it reaches um, the limiting factors. Now, if I'm working with carbon dioxide, if I have carbon dioxide, it means when I run out of water or light, I don't have enough water or light, then um, I can have the, they can be the limiting factors and then this graph stabilize. All right? The last one that can affect this is temperature. Now, enzymes are proteins, and they work at an optimum temperature. And the moment that you go over the optimum temperature, we will have them denaturing. In other words, they, they, their form, they will lose their form. They won't be able to operate. They won't be able to work. So that is why this graph is looking differently. So, yeah, at the optimum temperature, yeah, is where... Um, it will work at its best. So the word that you must remem remember is the optimum temperature where the enzymes will work at its best. And then after that, because the temperature is now too high, it can denature. Also, it can happen that they are running out of certain factors that they need. And that is why we have a decrease um, or it can just be that the enzymes are now destroyed. So you can be asked about these three graphs in any combination of questions. So just make sure you understand that one. All right. Now, in the syllabus, they also ask you about greenhouses. Now, just to make sure you know what is a greenhouse, it can be a smaller or a very large structure where they have plants and then they have an artificial environment here where they can control all the things that plants need. They can control the carbon dioxide, the amount of water, the amount of light, 
the temperature and they can make sure that the plants get the nutrients they need. Now when you look here you can see all these pipes and structures so they will control all of these things that the plants need to get optimum growth to be able to have a very good product and then obviously at the end of the day sell it or make money or very important to have food security so that everybody will have enough food available and we are using the process of photosynthesis to our advantage to improve a situation okay this is the same thing just to remind you what do we need we need water we need optimum sunlight humidity means around the plant it can't dry out temperature and optimum temperature that the plant likes and remember now different plants like different situations some will like um, clay soil some will like sandy soil and some of them will like the loam soil so we can absolutely control all the different factors in this situation to make sure that we can have the best plant and the best growth and enough food etc Okay, so you can bring that in correlation with photosynthesis where we control the whole situation. Now, um, they talk about crop yields. Now, yields will be the amount, so the amount of food that we can get when we have this greenhouse system. Okay, just a few things to um, think about. We did talk about this already, the heating and the lighting and the carbon dioxide that is needed and the watering. Okay, so we control all of those things and they can, the more we have, the more photosynthesis can take place, the better our crop yields will be. And what is very, very nice when it's in a structure like this, where it's protected, it's protected against um, very high temperatures, very cold temperatures, sun or rain, um, where the plants will actually um, die because of too much water. Also very important is this one. We control this, pest prevention. If we can prevent the pests from coming in, then we will have a better product. Okay, so all of this is artificially controlled by whoever owns the greenhouse. Okay, and why is this happening? Two reasons, to improve uh, food security so that we can have more food, or the other hand, people are making money. Um, just make sure that you remember the different factors that's important and go and study this, ladies and gents, that you are, are um, able to make the correlation. Okay, the other thing that's very important is the role of ATP. ATP is that energy carrier, the taxi, like I said, adenosine triphosphate. Now, it got its name because of its chemical structure. You don't need to know that. This first section is the work that you uh, will do in week 9 and 10, cellular respiration. It's the process where we use the um, oxygen and the glucose to make energy. The mitochondria, obviously, to make energy, the powerhouse of the cell, that is what we want. But this stage, we're just looking at photosynthesis. This whole story, the different cells, how the chloroplast is actually adapted for its job. So it's over and over the same thing. How is ATP important? ATP is one of the products, the, um, the energized uh, hydrogen atoms that is going from the light to the dark phase and ATP is the energy carrier it's carrying the energy over it's giving the chloroplast energy to photosynthesize so all of those things you have to remember when it comes to uh, the role of ATP now ladies and gents what I want to look at and inform you is you will always have investigation and in this ATP uh, the one that they emphasize is to investigate if light is needed for photosynthesis that is the one that is prescribed that we were supposed to do okay now we know that when a plant gets light it is photosynthesizing. So the experiment that we are doing is we take a piece of black paper that's covering the part of the leaf. So in other words, the parts that are showing, they will get the light, but this part will not get the light. So we want to prove that light is needed for photosynthesis. So in other words, if I do this for a while, it won't have any photosynthesis taking place here. 
But before I do that, I must first de-starch the plant because this plant will have food in its stores. So I de-starch the plant by putting it in a dark cupboard for a while so that it will use up all the glucose that it will have in its stores. Okay, and sometimes they talk about a potted plant, people, that just means that the plant is in a pot. Okay, so I start with a plant that is de-starched, that is very important. Then I take a leaf, okay. Now that leaf goes into a beaker on a Bunsen burner and a tripod and then it will be boiled. Now why are we boiling the leaf? Okay, we are doing that because we want to break the cell walls. We want to break the cell walls so that we can get to the chloroplast. Okay, so after the boiling is done, we, we take the leaf out and we put it in another beaker that contains alcohol. Okay, now the function of the alcohol is to actually take the chlorophyll now out of the leaf. Okay, so now the leaf is without chlorophyll and then I just let it cool down. You can use ice or just leave it at room temperature. Then that same leaf, it goes into a dish or a Petri dish and then I take some iodine solution. Why am I taking iodine solution? Because that's how we test for starch. So when I drop a few of the uh, iodine drops on top of the leaf, I will see. If the leaf is turning a blue-black color, like those areas are, it means that it contains starch, it has food. The parts that were not covered, they still made food, so they need light. And this section that is covered is not going to be black and blue because there's no starch here. It couldn't make any starch because it was covered. There were no light coming in. So this is what this experiment is all about. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you know what the different parts are doing. What is the functions? And then, ladies and gents, we need to make sure that you know how to do the graphs. Because that's a big problem sometimes. You confuse yourself. Now, we have a normal graphs, like for instance, the line graph, the bar graph, the histogram. And then we have the pie chart. Okay, so make sure you understand and you know how to do it. Remember, there's always a heading and this heading will contain what we have on the x-axis and what we have on the y-axis. Now, <clears throat> on the x-axis, we have a variable and that variable is called the independent variable. Now, it is the one, like I always say, that I can control. The one that I can control, I put on the x-axis. And now you're going to say, oh, but how are you going to control it? I am going to decide if this is, for instance, time. I'm going to decide how much, at what interval. Is it now minutes, every minute, every half an hour, every hour, every day, every week, every month? When am I going to measure whatever I am now investigating? So the independent variable is here, and then the dependent one is there, and that's the one that I'm investigating or the one that I am measuring. That is the result. That is one, what I want to check out. Okay, so this one, I can decide that one. I'm going to see what's going to happen. And then very important when you do the heading. The heading must be contain the X and the Y axis, the labels. What is here and what is written here must be mentioned in the heading, both of them, in order to have the correct heading. Okay, so now <clears throat> another problem that we have. Let me use the ruler. When you draw a graph, you are sometimes, I don't know, lazy or want a shortcut or want to take the drive through, I'm not sure, then your scale is incorrect. Now the scale means the following, when I'm drawing my graph, these intersections, they must be the same. So I'm using the ruler here, if you want to use smaller ones, you can use smaller ones, I'm using the centimeters there and here. But now I must make sure that I will be able to draw my graph on this, okay? So let's say, for instance, you have a table. doesn't matter what it is, time or minutes or whatever. So they give you two, five, 
then they give you 9, then they give you 12, and then suddenly they give you 20. Now, you can't just take that and write it down because the intervals will not be right. The, the difference between that is 3, the difference between that is 4, there we have 3, and there we have 8. So you can't just use it like that. You must use an interval that you will be able to draw this properly. Okay, more or less plus minus because there you have half, half, or what can be in between. So let's say, for instance, you want to use two, but then you're going to have a very big graph. Um, if you use five, maybe, it can work five, ten, fifteen, twenty. So there I, the half of five would be two and a half, so two will be there somewhere, okay? Then five is on the dot, nine will be there somewhere, 12 will be, that will be 12 and a half, so it's just a little bit that way, and then 20 on the dot. Or if you want to use two or three, as long as what is there and what is there, the difference is constant. It needs to stay the same. If it's two, if it's three, if it's ten, um, just as long as it's the same, here and there, because that is sometimes a problem. You can't just write it down like that. Don't do it. And if you still don't understand, please ask your teacher to explain to you because you lose marks unnecessarily here. How do we give marks for a graph? So first of all, there's the heading. The heading that must be here, that must contain the independent and the dependent variable. No units in the heading, though. That will be one mark sometimes, two, mark grade, uh, two marks for grade 10. Okay, now the type of graph. Let's say this is a line graph. So if you have a line graph, even if it's incorrect, you can still get that mark. Okay, then we have um, labels or x-axis. What is on the x-axis? What is on the y-axis? With their units, the units are always important. If you don't have the unit, you don't get the marks. Okay, and then the plotting. Plotting is, for instance, what I have there. That is my plotting. Okay, if your plotting is correct, you have it perfect, then you will get two marks. If you have stuff wrong, you can lose marks. Okay, so that is basically what we use. Sometimes there's keys, sometimes there's scale. That can be additional marks um, granted for a graph. Okay, now the... Um, investigation, what you need to know. When we have any kind of practical, like for instance to investigate um, the effect of light on the rate of photosynthesis, they can ask you any one of these things. They can ask you the aim, give us a hypothesis, investigative question, what is the dependent or independent variable, what is the fixed variable, what is the control, and then very important, what is reliability and what is validity, what makes it um, valid. Okay, now, first of all, people, investigative question is a question. Don't forget the question mark. So if you see something happening, when I put the pot on the windowsill, then the plant grows towards the light. It's like the plant is growing skewed to get closer to the light. You see that, and now you want to investigate if it is the light that's doing this. So first you must have a hypothesis. It's your statement. It's what you see and what you want to investigate. Now, your hypothesis can be correct or it can be, it can be wrong. You are most now investigating it. So, if plants are placed on a windowsill, then plants will grow towards light. So, that is what you now are stating. You don't know if it's right, you're going to investigate. So, what is your question? Investigative question. Do plants on a windowsill grow towards the light? The same thing just in question form. Now you want to go and do the experiment, so you must have an aim. And what is the aim? To investigate if plants on a windowsill grow towards the light. So you can see these three things are almost similar. It's just the way that you uh, write it that is different. Okay, so the aim will always start to see uh, to find out, to investigate if plants on a windowsill grow towards the light. So in the section that they give to you in the exam, if you look for to investigate, those words, you will know that is the aim. Okay. 
And now, let's say for instance, you want to draw a graph of this. You want to see if light makes the plant grow. So what's the two things that's important? Light and grow. Do you know how quickly this plant is going to grow? No, that is what you want to measure. So the growth will be the dependent variable. That's the thing that I want to see. That is what I want to measure. And the light will be here because I'm going to control the amount of light. The more light I give, the less light I give. So the amount of light I'm going to control and the amount of growth will be my result. I want to see what it is. Okay? And that is now one, when they ask you what is the dependent variable and what is the independent variable. If you at first don't know when you just have the hypothesis, then just go and try and draw a graph to uh, see and ask yourself the question, which one can you control and which one are you going to see? Now, <clears throat> the fixed variables, the things that must stay the same. Because if they change, then the result of your experiment is going to change. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be valid and it's not going to be reliable. So it will cause, excuse me, a problem. So the same size of pot plant, I can't have one big plant and one small plant. The same amount of water because when I change any one of these things, I'm not looking at how light influences this anymore. I'm looking at other factors. Okay, now ladies and gents, reliability. What is reliability? An experiment becomes reliable when I get the same result when I do it anywhere. Okay, so first of all, what they say is we need to repeat the experiment. When we repeat the experiment, then what happens? We get the same result, and when we get the same result, it is reliable. What is the other thing that we can do? Increase the sample size. So instead of just using five people in an experiment, I'm using 500, and then I still get the same result. So what happens now? It shows me, even if I use more people, I still get the same result, so it's reliable. If they ask you straightforward, what makes this experiment reliable? You will say, by repeating the experiment several times and by increasing the sample size. Maybe this is not really relevant for this experiment, but repeating the experiment is going to tell us that it's reliable. So you also need to look at your experiment and you need to look at your mark allocation. Okay, then... What they sometimes do is, instead of asking it straight like this, they are swapping it around. They are saying, if you use 500 people instead of just five people in the experiment, how will it influence the experiment? What will be the effect? And then you will say, it will make the experiment more reliable. So you must always use that word. Okay. Validity is when things stay the same, like we use the same pot plant, the same amount of water, that makes the experiment valid. Okay, now ladies and gents, the next section of the theory, and it's all about humans, this time you smile because we're not busy with the plants anymore. And first of all, we need to look, before we look at our digestive system, we need to look at our teeth, because... Our teeth look a specific way because of its function. And I'm not sure if you can still remember the different ones. So let's start with the first one, the incisor. That's the, the teeth that you normally get first. Your mother will have pictures of you. Oh, so cute when you got your first two teeth or the first tooth. So that will normally be the first, the front tooth, the bottom or the top, okay, teeth. So that is the incisor. Now when you look at the shape, you can see this incisor. It looks as if it's flattened because you're going to use this um, for a specific uh, job. All right. So they are supposed to, you, you use that on um, leaves and 
um, I want to say fruits and vegetables, the vegetables that you most don't like to eat so much. Okay, so it's like a blade, a blade that's cut in leaves. The canine, this one is the one that you always see in vampire movies where it's these fangs. Ne? So we don't have fangs, sorry to tell you. You're not a vampire, but these are the canines. And in animals, when you look here, those are the teeth that is so threatening most of the time. Okay, that's the canines, and they shows, uh, show us, they show us that they are eating meat because they need to rip the meat. Okay, then the premolar, pre means before the molar, so these teeth we get before the molar teeth, so they are the premolar. Look at them. They make me think of fists that you you know, that grinds you like this. So the teeth will also, they will grind. That's their job, okay? They will have to grind and crush and um, make the food smaller, break the cells so that the enzymes in your mouth can start to work on it. Okay, so that's the different types of teeth that you have. And we call um, your teeth and the formula that you have dentitions, okay? Dent refers to make you think of a dentist. So dentitions, that's all about teeth. All right. Now, I think you may have forgotten. We have three types. We have carnivores that's eating meat. Now, when you look at this skull, you can see yo, it's a strong jaw. Ne? And then the canine teeth, mm -hmm, they are very strong because they are just going to eat meat. They need to rip the raw meat from the bone. And that is many times our predators. Okay? And you can also still see the premolars. They are still sharp, so they are going to help with this. Even the incisors, um, they are sharp. They need to um, kill the prey and rip it out. It sounds you know, vicious, but that is why they look like this. They are built like this for their function. Then the herbivore is the animal that is just chewing and chewing and chewing. Look at this section, for instance. It's much smaller because... Um, and precise, those teeth are the ones that's going to do the cutting and the cutting and the cutting. We don't have any uh, strong canines here because we're not going to rip. You see, carrots, fruits and vegetables. So these animals are just going to eat plants. They need cutting, biting off the pieces. And then they need this section, the premolars and the molars, to grind the teeth smaller, to break the cell walls, so that the enzymes can start working in on this in your mouth already. And there's us now, the last one, omnivores. We eat meat and we eat fruits and vegetables. Some people eat more of this and not enough of this, but that is our possibilities. Look at the color coding. There's our incisors. There's the canine, premolars, and the molars. And there you can see, they look like this because they also have to grind now. They have to crush and break the plant. So you are also using your incisors to cut. You will eat preferably your meat um, cooked. So you don't need the canine teeth to cut or to rip it out of. Your mother is going to look strangely at you when you start ripping uh, bites into that piece of steak. Okay, it's not necessary. You can eat the meat because it's cooked with the teeth that you have. So ladies and gents, um, the teeth are built in a specific way because of the food that you eat. We say this the whole time. Um, structure because of function. So the structure looks like this because of the function. This is study work and this is not the first time you hear um, about teeth and then omnivores and herbivores. So just make sure you can still remember. All right, now we go to us, the elementary canal, the people. Here I have my boyfriend to show you exactly the different parts, okay? And yes, you have to study this. You have to be able to label. We start there in the mouth and you know what is in your mouth, your teeth and your tongue. Okay, and here at the sides, we have the salivary glands. Those things that's normally making the saliva, when you see a nice piece of meat, you start salivating, ne? you can't wait. So that is because of the salivary glands in your mouth. Then here we have your pharynx, and then we go down to the esophagus. But don't forget, you also 
when you breathe in, you also breathe air in. So there's another section here, the trachea, that is there. But to prevent food from going into your lungs, there we have in the glottis, the epiglottis, that is like a structure that's going to close that line in order for the food to go through the esophagus. And this esophagus will have peristalsis. It's a, a, a movement where the, the food will be forced down. Okay, And then in your mouth, obviously, with the teeth, and all the enzymes, they're going to start breaking down the food all, already in your mouth. Okay? Then it comes down the esophagus, it goes into your stomach, and your stomach will have enzymes and acids. Okay? Acid, acidic. Then from the stomach, it goes to your intestines. Now we have large intestines and small intestines. Why do we have such a lot? Because we need to give you time to digest all of the food and to get all of the nutrients out of your body, okay? There you have your rectum and there you have your anus. So what comes in obviously must go out. Hopefully what goes out um, you don't need. It, it's just waste, okay? Also what you have here is the liver. There's also functions important, the gallbladder. And there behind is the pancreas, which becomes important a little bit later. Okay, so that is the main parts, and now their function. Let's have a look. Okay, same story. In the mouth here already, what happens? You bite down on, on the teeth, they break the food, they become smaller, it mixes with the saliva. In the saliva, we have enzymes, and the first um, type of enzyme is carbohydrases. That's the name of the enzyme. It works in on carbohydrates, and you must like to eat starch and sugar, those things. So it starts in your mouth already. Okay, so it becomes smaller and it becomes like a ball. We call it a bolus. And then you swallow and it goes down your um, esophagus and then it's just transported with those movement, peristalsis, down to your stomach. Okay, and now when it reaches your stomach, it now needs to be digested into even smaller pieces. And there we have an enzyme we call protease. It works in on, yes, you've guessed it, proteins. And then we also have acids in there, okay? Now, the acids, they're also important to protect you against any types of bacteria or whatever comes into your stomach with the food that is not good for you, okay? Then from the stomach, it goes to the small intestine, all right? The small intestine and the large intestine. And in your intestines, we will find three enzymes. Carbohydrates, working in on carbohydrates. Protease, working in on proteins. And lipase, that's working in on lipids. Yes, and maybe you've seen it by now. The moment the word ends with A-S-E, that is the enzyme, okay? Um, Another enzyme that we have is lactase, uh, not relevant yet at the moment, but just to uh, explain, lactase is the enzyme that works in on milk, okay, when you digest milk. Now, in your intestine, it is so long to give time so that all the nutrients that needs to be absorbed into your body and um, assimilated into your body with um, the fluids that it can be absorbed. And then whatever is left is considered waste. You don't need it so it can come out through your rectum and your anus. Okay, so that is the basic stuff that you need to know, just the basics, all right? Now, <clears throat> there's certain terms that becomes important. We are still busy with the same guy, the same sections, all right? Now, words like ingestion, egestion, digestion, absorption, all of those things, okay? Where is what happening? Okay, so let's have a look. The five words, the terminology that you need to know. Now, ingestion, the first one, is when the food comes in. That is what the word is telling us. Ingestion will take place here in the mouth, taking in of food.
And immediately when it's in your mouth, you now start with the digestion. We are breaking down the food because the hamburger cannot go down like it is. We need to chew the hamburger in small bites to make the pieces of food smaller so that we can get to the nutrients that is inside. Okay, so that is digestion. That is when it's broken down into smaller pieces that the body can handle so that it can now be absorbed. The next one, absorption, is the digested food that is now absorbed into the, the blood and the bodies. Okay, assimilation is now the absorbed food that provides us with energy. You will find them in the cells now because what happens in the cells? We get the glucose there, we get the mitochondria there, it gives us energy. And then egestion is like exit, it's going out. That is all the food that is not digested, it's not digestible like some types of fiber and it's waste, you don't need it, so it needs to come out and that is egestion. Just make sure again that you know the terms for or the definitions for the different terms. Okay, just to make sure, because some people find it difficult to understand um, what is the difference between absorption and assimilation. Now, this represents your digestive system. Now, because of the way that your digestive system is built, you're going to absorb the different nutrients that is now very, very small, like for instance, the smallest sugar will be glucose. The smallest um, uh, protein will be in the form of amino acids, the building blocks. And then the smallest fat would be um, the triglycerides. Okay, so they will be absorbed into their smallest form and it goes into the blood. And the moment it's in the blood and it's absorbed by the body cell, it's assimilated. The moment it's in the body cell, it's the assimilation. Absorption is from the digestive system. It goes into the blood and then the blood takes it to the body cell. And the moment it goes from the blood to the body cell, that is the assimilation. Okay. Now, ladies and gents, we need to look at the adaptations. Why is your body adapted or how and why is it looking like that? Okay, so inside your intestines, you will find structures. There is lots of folds inside your intestines to increase the surface area. And those folds, they look like this. You will see on the folds, there's even more villi. And the villi helps with the movement of the food okay and then one of these villi this is how it looks and it's very important that you just know a few things because you can be asked about it so when i take one of those things and we make it bigger it looks like this the villi okay now first of all the moment you look at the shape you can see it increases the surface area immediately. So when the surface area is increased, there's a better chance for absorption of nutrients so that nothing goes to waste. And this is just one. Look at how many you have. And the fact that there's folds, and on the folds, the folds is also increasing the surface area. On the folds, we have the villi. So you have a lot of surface area for absorption here. Okay, so let's have a look. The first layer of cells that we have here is epithelial cells. Like they say here, it's a single layer. So because it's a single layer and it's not very thick, then it's possible for the nutrients to move through this layer to get to the inside. Okay. We also have here in between what we call goblet cells that is providing mucus. Now mucus is helping with the movement. Mucus is helping to make the food more uh, fluid. All right. And helps the nutrients to dissolve in that. And then it moves through this epithelial layer and it goes into the bloodstream here. Here you see blue is for uh, CO2 rich blood. And the red is for oxygen-rich blood. And it's a whole network. Look at that. It's not just one pop pipeline. It's like a network. So the more blood we have, the more nutrients can be absorbed. And that helps you to get more food into your body. 
Okay, now another thing that you need to remember is that the mucus here is alkaline because it neutralizes, it needs to help to neutralize the acidity of your stomach. Okay, and there in the, on the inside, that green section is your lymph vessel, lacteal, that you have there in the middle that is supposed to uh, filter, to clean whatever you have. It needs to get rid of the substances that we don't know. So I say again, go and have a look. Make sure you know how your intestines is adapted for digestion and how the villi is adapted for digestion. That's the type of questions that becomes important. Okay, now last for this section, week eight, we talk about blood glucose. Now, this is very important for grade 12 as well. Now, when people struggle with the glucose in their blood, when they cannot control it themselves, when they need an injection, uh, we say they have diabetes. Now, you have two types of diabetes. You have diabetes type 1. And I normally help the learners to remember when you have diabetes type 1, it looks to me like an injection. So when you have diabetes type 1, that's where you have to inject yourself with something, I will explain now, to keep your blood sugar levels constant so that you won't go into a coma or be affected. Okay, uh, blood, di Diabetes type 2 that is a different one where we, because of our lifestyle choices, that means not exercising, eating too much, having a sedentary lifestyle, I sometimes say. Sedentary meaning you're just lying on the couch, flipping the switch, the remote from one channel to another and eating while you do that. Then many times we become overweight, we don't practice, we eat too much of the wrong food and then we get diabetes type 2. Okay, now how does it work in your body? First of all, let's just have a look here. We want normal blood sugar levels. That is what we want. Okay, so the moment the blood glucose levels increase, then a message is sent to your brain to say, oh, oh, here's a problem. There's too much glucose in this person's blood. We need to do something. And then a hormone, and that hormone's name is insulin. And that is also what we will find in the injection, that they are people with diabetes type 1 is injecting themselves with insulin because the insulin is a hormone that's now going to bring down the blood glucose levels. Now how is it going to do that because the glucose can't just disappear. So what is happening is that the glucose, here you see this structure that you see here, this is your liver. So inside your liver the glucose is changed to glycogen because it can only be stored in your liver in the form of glycogen. So we have words sounding the same here. You have to now study and practice. Glucose is changed into glycogen. So it's taken out of the blood. Okay. It's taken out of the blood because the insulin that was secreted by cells in the pancreas is now telling, it's giving the instruction, the excess glucose must now ch be changed to glycogen and stored there until the body needs it. So the blood sugar levels will go down and then many times this will go back to normal, which is great. That is what we want and that is insulin that is doing that for us. But sometimes when you have a problem, there will still be glucose in your urine. And that's also an indication because you have so much glucose in your body or the insulin is not working properly or you don't have enough insulin and then this process cannot happen and then some of the glucose will be in your, in your urine and then we know there's a problem and the doctors will need to assist you to rectify the problem. They will have to give you insulin injections, for instance. Okay, But the whole idea is to get everything back to normal, normal blood sugar levels. Sometimes what happens is you don't eat breakfast and then you don't eat lunch and you so busy you forget okay so now your blood glucose levels they go down they go down too low and you start feeling tired you want to sleep in class you feel dizzy you don't have energy and that is because there's not enough glucose in your body now again 
your brain will get the message to say, oh, there's not enough glucose. And then in your pancreas, another hormone that we call glucagon, okay? Glucagon will do what its name says. It's going to make sure that there's enough glucose, okay? The glucose are not gone. The glucose are back. So they are changing the glycogen that is stored in the liver. Remember, it was stored in the liver for a rainy day. So now the glycogen is changed back into glucose. It is now secreted back into your blood. The blood sugar levels increase and it goes back to normal and everybody's happy. You are feeling full of energy again and you can focus and you can concentrate. So very important there's a few things that you need to focus on. When blood glucose levels go too high, the hormone is insulin. Insulin will bring it back to normal. When the blood glucose levels go down, when it's too low, glucagon, a different hormone, will be secreted and glucagon will bring it back to normal. So when do we use glucagon? When the glucose are gone. Do you see that? When the glucose are low, glucagon. Then we use that hormone. And where is it getting it? Don't forget. In the liver. And then that is glycogen. Oh, and please remember, don't confuse the two. Go and write it down until you remember. Glucagon is the hormone that we use when the glucose are gone. And glycogen is the form that the glucose are stored in in the liver. This is important, ladies and gents, because it's important for grade 12 as well. And that is what the word homeostasis means. Homeostasis is we want the what is external and internal in your body to be in balance. We want it to be normal. So homeostasis of blood glucose is just to get the blood glucose levels normal. So ladies and gents, very important here is that you um, make sure that you study all the theory that your teacher expects for you. He will give you a scope or page numbers or whatever the case may be. But then you have to practice. You can't just study and not practice. So I know uh, we are running out of time. Luckily, you can stop the video and come back when you have more energy. But we need to look at a few examples and you need to practice. Because many of the problems that you have, it's not with the theory. It's the way that it's asked and you're not exactly sure how you should answer it. So let's have a look here. Let me just put all of the other things away. Uh, when you, maybe you forgot, maybe you didn't focus, but when you get a formal test or an exam paper, it should look like this, more or less. I'm using an old uh, test paper, like you can see, 2018. Um, if it's a common paper, there will be a badge from the education department. Otherwise, it will be the badge of your school. Okay. Um, there's normally instructions that you should read. And then we start, as always, with the multiple choice questions. Now, multiple choice, please. There's always one of those answers that is incorrect. So you have to choose between them. But please focus on the question. And then when you write it down in your answer book or on your CAS paper, you must remember to number it correctly. And then only write A or B or C or D. Don't write the words as well. You're not going to get marks. That is not the instruction. Read your instructions and answer the questions according to that. Okay. Now, photosynthesis. What happens with photosynthesis? The plant is losing what? And the plant is absorbing what? Okay. Now, when you remember, think back when it comes to photosynthesis, what do we need? The plant needs water plus the plant needs CO2. Then it's using sunlight. Okay. It's using enzymes. And then obviously it needs, you remember, there's our chloroplast. It needs the chlorophyll that's inside. And then it gives us sugar and what? And oxygen for humans. So plant lose what? Plant lose definitely oxygen. It's not losing sugar because it's using it. Plant is not using water. It's not using water and it's not using carbon dioxide. So oxygen 
is what the plant uses, and what is it absorbing? Water, which is correct because it's absorbing water. That is why it's important to remember your equation. All right? Then, the process where digested food substances become part of the cells. You remember our story? The digestive system, when it goes into the blood, we call it absorption, blood of blood, okay? And then it goes into the cells. The moment it goes into the cells, it is called assimilation. So the answer is A, okay? The next one, they use a graph, and then they give you statements. So they are making three statements, and they are going to ask you on the next page, let me just show you, which one of these statements are correct. So before looking at the answer, you need to look at the question first, okay? What do we have here? We have carbon dioxide there, and it's all about the rate of photosynthesis. Which things are influencing this? Light, carbon dioxide, what else? Temperature, we need the op optimum temperature and um, the enzymes and the energy and the chlorophyll. But now what are they saying in the statement? Yes, the light, low intensity is a little bit of light. Yes, we will have photosynthesis, but not the rate will not be high and then it will stabilize. Uh, when it's a higher light intensity, we'll, we will have higher rate and then it stabilizes because of the carbon concentration, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, remember, can be toxic, so at some stage it needs to settle. What is statement one saying? At low light intensity, an increase in carbon dioxide concentration will cause an initial increase in the rate of photosynthesis. Yes, it is. Initially, there is an increase. Statement two, they say an increase in the carbon dioxide will result in a higher rate of photosynthesis at a higher light intensity. That is not happening. There's the higher rate, but now higher light intensity, it's not going up. It's stabilizing. So that one doesn't sound a la la to me. Okay. Statement three, a high carbon dioxide concentration and an increase in light intensity does not change the rate of photosynthesis. Yes, there it is. It shows us. It stays the same. So it looks like those two things are correct. So now I'm looking for number one and two on the next page. Let's have a look. Number one and two. So what is our answer? Number D. So by eliminating the things that are wrong, you get to the right answer. Okay, and 1.2, ladies and gents, please remember, follow the instructions. A only, B only, both A and B or none. That is your answer. Okay, um, let's look at one of them, for instance. 1.2.2, light conditions in which photosynthesis takes place. Only in green light. Uh -uh. Invisible light from any light source. Our answer is B, then you write B only because that is your instruction. Okay, let's look at the terminology. Let's choose one there. Okay, 1.3.2, the organelle in which photosynthesis takes place. That would be the chloroplast. So that is what you write, what you write down. Okay, you read properly what they ask and then you give an answer. Okay, ladies and gents, what I wanted to say with the multiple choice as well, if there's a question that you find confusing and it's taking time, you can always come back to it. But please, never leave an open space. If you have to guess at the end of the day, please guess, because maybe uh, your intuition or what you have studied is still there somewhere and the voices in your head are talking to you, so you may guess the correct answer, but don't leave any open spaces. We can look for marks when there's something, but when there's nothing, your mark will also be the same, nothing, okay? Now, section B, this is how you can expect this, okay? You can have a diagram that you must label beforehand to get your GPS working before you look at the questions, and then they can ask you questions about this, okay? So there you can see it's the liver, there I can see it's the pancreas, that's the hepatic portal vein. This is your intestines that they show here. And um, now they ask questions. Identify part C, 
and state its function. Read the question properly. Don't forget about the and. And look at the mark allocation. It is two. Okay. So C, normally you have to write C is what? C is the hepatic portal vein. And what is the function? The function of the vein is to transport the nutrients that is absorbed to the liver. Okay. Next one. One function of part A. What is A? Is that structure, which is the pancreas. Okay. Now they say, in what form is glucose stored? That you must have to study. Remember, don't get confused with the two words. So that is glycogen. All right. So this is how they carry on. They start with the easier questions, and then they go and they ask you um, structural adaptations. Why does it look like this? Okay. Um, let's look at this one. Name the functional unit of E. What is E? E, that section, will be the intestines. So what is the functional unit in E? The villi that we looked at. Okay. Villi is more than one. Villus is just one. But any one of the two answers will be correct. Now they say explain two. And the moment they have the word two in capital letters like that, it means that when we mark, we're only going to mark the first two. We're not going to read through everything to try and find your answer. It's not allowed. We need to mark the first two only. But now look there. It's two things, but it's counting four marks. So it means two by two. It means that when you mention something, you have to explain something about that. So what is the first thing that you can remember? Remember the villi that we talked about? You can say something like um, the villi shape um, increases the surface area or the... Um, they don't specify for specific functions, so you can mention any functions. You can say it increases the surface area. You can say the epithelial cells are thin so that um, the, the, the diffusion absorption can happen easier. You can say there's a network of blood cells there, or blood vessels, arteries and veins there in the middle, capillaries, so they can absorb the nutrients. So you have to say it looks like this and this is the function. Don't forget that. Okay. Then the last one, give the name of the part which is responsible for the control of glucose levels. It's that one. It's the pancreas. So please, ladies and gents, look at the mark allocation. Look at the question. Don't just look at one thing and then forget about the rest because that's some of the um, mistakes that you make continuously. Okay, next one. This is the investigative question. Okay, now have a look here at the top. They say the learners conducted an experiment to determine. That to determine, it's like to investigate. It tells me what they're going to do. The effect of light on the rate of photosynthesis. So that is my hypothesis. And that gives me my dependent and independent variables. I have light and the rate of photosynthesis. That's the two things that I'm going to investigate. Okay, then they mention a lot of things. I'm sure they're going to ask you about maybe validity or anything like that. But um, when you look at your um, table, um, if you have to draw a graph, for instance, it doesn't look as if they ask you for a graph here. But um, we have the intensity, we see it increases, and then the number of disks floating. When you now look at the experiment, you will see why they're talking about this. They just ask the question a little bit differently because it's all about um, the amount of the floating means most now uh, what did you get rid of? So now it's lighter. Okay. So um, when you have to draw a graph, remember when we look at light and the rate of photosynthesis, we have the dependent and independent variable. So always go back, look for to determine. It immediately gives you your hypothesis and then your dependent and independent variable. Okay. Um, I see they ask you the year about photosynthesis, but describe the process, give reasons for photosynthesis. And remember, why do we have photosynthesis? We do that so that plants can have food and that humans can have oxygen. 
Okay, that is why it's important. So please remember, ladies and gents, the whole thing about this investigation is they can ask you to do the hypothesis. So you look for it. They can ask you to do the investigative question. They can ask you to give the aim. Then they ask you about the dependent variable or the independent variable. They can ask you about validity. They can ask you about reliability. Then they can ask you to do a graph. They can even give you a graph and ask you to do a table. So please make sure that you cover all your bases when it comes to this experimental question. Okay. All right. Then we don't have essay questions anymore in life sciences. It's just uh, section B and there will be a question uh, 3 and 4. But have a look here. They say, describe the differences in the dentition of the herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores in terms of their nutritional requirements. Now, teachers can still go and take old essay questions and then divide them into smaller questions or shorter questions because the mark allocation is too much. It can go to four, six, maybe eight. So when we look at this, at the dentition, they can ask you maybe just for herbivores or compare herbivores and carnivores. So this original question can be divided into smaller questions if you now have old um, question papers that um, is available to you. You can go and have a look. Uh, for instance, let me take the memo and just show you the memo uh, for this essay question where they discuss how the incisors, the canines, the premolars and the molars look and what their function uh, is. So it is the structure and the function and that gives you four marks. Okay, so these things, you can still use it. You don't have to throw away the old papers. You can still practice and still use it. Maybe you get these questions as well in um, your test. So ladies and gents, if we can just um, get back um, to me again. I hope this helped. Uh, we didn't cover all of the detail that is necessary. These are the basic things that is prescribed in the ATPs, but I, um, if you can just sit on the chair and try this and practice, uh, you should be fine. So good luck, hang in there, and remember the only way you will be successful is by doing your part and by studying. And then please, if you need any help, please ask your teachers, they are available and they also work very hard to help you succeed, okay? Good luck.